So the car tax is percolating, but what do the communities really think about it? We'll talk about it tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Tonight, Brian Daniels joins us. He is uh, the new boss of the Rhode Island League in Cities and Towns. He takes over for a guy who was here for a long time, Dan Beardsley, who was often a, a resource here and um, a guy I argued with from time to time but enjoyed it. We'll see if uh, Brian picks up the mantle. I'm sure he'll do very well. He's a former policy director, by the way, for this guy, Chafee, who just keeps bubbling up. Uh, although I'm not going to stick in with any questions on that tonight. It is great to have you aboard. All right, you were waiting for the summer. You got the summer on the, on the what was the high today? Well, we, we no, well, how do we know? Because we taped the show early in the afternoon, don't tell anybody, but I was driving in, the high was like 96 on the car yeah. thermometer. So you like that, yeah. Kev? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my kid was at uh, uh, Fenway last night in the bleachers. They were sweating. They were sweating a lot. Uh, you know, day games in the bleachers. You ever go day, day games in the bleachers, Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hot. It's hot. Yeah. All right. Well, we, so, right we, we solved that. 95 officially at the airport. Got to be the airport. All right. Let's go to the rundown. Got to be the rundown. Uh, oaths and outbursts, they say. Yes, that's uh, Lexi's way of explaining whatever the heck's going on in Washington right now. And, of course, every day is something, something, something. Headlines like this. Yeah, so this, you know, this is one of the things we talked about early on that has been completely missing from the conversation, the idea that Donald Trump still uh, has a problem with the emolument clause, if you can figure that one out. It seems like, a, it's like an oldie but a goodie complaint about, about Donald Trump, but that's what that allegation is all about. And now, uh, you know, the follow-up from the Rose Garden last week where he says he's willing to testify. Now Sessions will testify. The attorney general, who hasn't really hung out with the president much reportedly, is coming to Senate Intel tomorrow in a public hearing. That's brand new to us at press time. Uh, and something that I think a lot of people are going to follow because there are rumors that he had other conversations with Russians that he didn't talk about when he first got cleared for the position. Yada, da, yada, da, yada, da. Uh, here's the latest in Washington. Well, first, I think he should be sworn under oath. On Face the Nation, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer ran through the questions he wants answered by the Attorney General. Did he interfere uh, with the Russian uh, investigation before he recused himself? The president said Comey was fired because of Russia. How does that fit in with his recusal? Sessions had been scheduled to testify before a different committee tomorrow about the Department of Justice budget. But he announced the switch to the Intelligence Committee this weekend after it became clear that he was only going to get grilled about his role in Comey's firing. He had already recused himself, and then suddenly he is the one apparently recommending to the president that Comey be fired. We want to be able to get his side of it, get all the facts out there. Sessions recused himself from the Russia investigation over three months ago after admitting he had not disclosed two meetings with the Russian ambassador in 2016. Comey suggested to senators last week that there might be more to it than that. We also were aware of facts that I can't discuss in an open setting that would make his continued engagement in a Russia-related investigation problematic. As for the president's offer to give his side of the story... Would you be willing to speak under oath to uh, give your version of, of 100 percent. Yes, 100 percent. Uh, so, again, Sessions will uh, do his thing tomorrow. And the one thing I, I just want to say about that story, I, I think it kind of was self-explanatory in some ways, but can I just do an FYI? You know that Jack Reed is the only top official in Rhode Island who has never come to this set. I, I don't know. Is there some, did I say something wrong? You know, a few years back, I asked Jack, I was asking Jack Reed about banking contributions on the banking committee. But, you know, it's not Watergate, for heaven's sakes. And a guy who's so establishment and our senior senator is, is you know, if you want to find him on television, find him on Fox National, CBS National, NBC National. Uh, he'll do a couple things. I know he likes Ted and Tim on uh, Newsmakers, and who doesn't? But uh, at some juncture, the insult settles in significantly, and it's beginning to. Senator Reid, come on in and talk some issues. There's no smoking gun. Stop behaving like there is one please. All righty. Uh, I mean, can you imagine I had to say that? Lexi's happy I said that. She's tired of talking to the staff. Oh, yes, we're going to, we'll try to make it happen. Oh, he's on Fox again. Oh, we'll try to make it happen. Okay, lost confidence. Now, this is interesting. Lindsey Graham, 
who always kind of speaks his mind, the senator from South Carolina, said something pretty fascinating here, said that, and then he said this. You may be the first president in history to go down because you can't stop inappropriately talking about an investigation that if you just were quiet would clear you. Hmm. Yeah, maybe and maybe not, but there's no doubt that temperament and discipline, you know, these things about presidentiality are still the things that most bother establishment Republicans about Donald Trump. And those things, in the end, may very well get him. Speaking of, uh, as I said, uh, Senator and Governor Chafee, here's uh, another headline. Now he's spitting out that he's not real comfortable with the Democrats. He said so on the radio today as well. Uh, I don't know what he's doing. He was here just, you know, a few weeks ago, and he just keeps talking as if Burrowville and that power plant's the beginning and the end. I mean, that's his reason, it seems, that he's getting very publicly involved. But he did a two-step uh, this morning, uh, earlier this morning on WPR on Tara Granahan show on Governor Raimondo that was absolutely from the script of somebody who's running against her. So back to the future? I, I don't know. But uh, blame us in the media, because as soon as a pile of some note starts spitting out that he or she might run, we just chase that, uh, well, we just chase that car until we slam right into it. It's kind of a story with Link, seems to me. All right, car tax is the conversation, amongst other things, for the leagues of city and towns, or League of Cities and Towns. I think that's the right way to say it. Um, here's Speaker Matty Ello when he introduced the car tax reduction. I'm delivering on a promise to begin the phase out of a regressive oppressive tax. It reimburses our local cities and towns for any revenue loss so there's no local impact. And it addresses all of our main principles uh, that we intended to address. Because this is really one way or another the people's money. Um, and the people have demanded this. The people expect this. And we are here to serve the, the will of the people. And so here are some of the headlines that go along with that when it comes to the local reaction. WPR.com, mayors back the car tax plan, uh, but the $22 million price tag is kind of heavy uh, for this fiscal year, especially when we've got growing budget deficits. And a handful of cities and towns get lion's share Rhode Island cash relief for the lost car tax revenue, which is true because when you have an imbalanced formula, you're going to get an imbalanced result off the top, seems to me. Uh, Brian Daniels is the new executive director of the Rouen League of Cities and Towns. Welcome. Nice to have you. Thank you very much for having me. Don't you agree? It's, you know, if you're already out of whack and you just do this kind of reduction, it's going to stay out of whack for yeah. a while. It's, uh, it's definitely a challenge. The League of Cities and Towns, the members, uh, our mayors and our town managers have supported reform because they know that the system is broken. It's frustrating. It's complicated. It doesn't make sense that the car tax can change hundreds of dollars just by crossing the border. Rhode Island's not competitive with Connecticut and Massachusetts. So we've strongly Heck, endorsed. it changes across town lines. Exactly, right. So you can go from one town to another and spend $400, $500 more for the same vehicle just right. from moving. Right. So it's a system that's been in place since pretty much 1998, since when they started the last repeal. And we're happy that the speaker and the governor and others have really made this a priority about trying to, to promote car tax reform. Uh, you know what? I'm going to leave it there because that's the uh, diplomatic thing to say, <laughs> and I completely disagree with the premise. I don't think any of this is about car tax reform. Uh, one of them wanted to save an election, and the other one wanted to say, me too. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, since we're talking uh, to Brian about the car tax and the League of Cities and Towns perspective on it, why don't we just give you an overall view as to what happened last week? In the battle to cut the car tax, Rhode Islanders first want to cut down on concerns. My wife and I both finally own two cars that are dependable. According to House Speaker Mattiello's plan, Andrew Poyant would soon see some relief, but he wants to know where exactly that relief is coming from. We have to reimburse the city somehow, and there's there still is no plan of how we're going to end up making up that money. The Speaker's proposal says state money would be used to reimburse communities for the roughly $221 million the car tax currently provides. Them. If the communities are reimbursed uh, for 100% of their lost revenue, it is 
property tax relief. That relief will be phased in over the next six years until the tax is completely eliminated in 2023. Pledging his support, Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza has started planning. I've asked my finance department to delay sending car tax bills for a few weeks if necessary so we can limit the need for credits or refunds. But other municipalities remain concerned as this bill is on track to become official just before the fiscal year starts on July 1st. And there are communities that have, are putting their budgets together, they're getting ready to put out their tax bills, so it's very difficult for them to adapt to these new changes while the process is already ongoing. I mean, that's an absolutely fair observation that Brian made in that, in that news piece. This thing I wouldn't say it comes out of thin air. It came during the uh, campaign season last year, but immediate enactment, and when we have fiscal years cut in half, and each municipality has its own little calendar to do business and billing cycles, it's an administrative nightmare, is it not? It's, it's definitely a challenge. If there's one thing we've heard from cities and towns on the speaker's proposal, is that it would take effect on July 1st. And it's going to be very challenging. Some communities have already put out their tax bills. Some are in the process of doing it. You heard Mayor Alorza say that he was delaying. Uh, so communities are still trying to figure out how this gets implemented. We won't really know for the next few weeks to see, to understand what the final proposal looks like. And so everyone's kind of in a holding pattern to find out what's, uh, what's going to pass and then how do we react to it. Mm. Administrative stuff aside, let me go back to a point that I was making. Uh, prior to the break, and that is that the League of Cities and Towns, which which generally, and Dan Beardsley, uh, your predecessor, uh, had this kind of, you know, perfect way of, you know, doing the diplomatic two-step. By the way, your job is not easy. It's the League of Cities and Towns is not a unified organization. Right. I mean, oftentimes the communities are pitted against each other, right? right? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So when the car tax conversation started, uh, even in January, we knew that we didn't want to have a situation where some of our communities were fighting with each other. So what we did is we came up with um, our principles of car tax reform. So rather than support or oppose various proposals, we could evaluate them based on the needs. And really it comes down to three questions. The first is, are the cities and towns made whole for any uh, car tax reform so that we don't have any cuts to services like schools or public safety? Second is, um, are we starting to harmonize and move the communities to a level playing field so you don't have those great disparities between communities and that we are more competitive with Connecticut and Massachusetts? And third, are we um, providing as much tax relief as possible to as many people as possible? And by looking at the, the car tax proposals from those principles, it is easier to take a look at the package and how we're improving the system versus are we helping one community versus another. All right, so I wanted you to get, spit that out in its totality because I want to go back and tackle each one of sure. those principles because I think that is actually pretty well thought out. It's a policy guy. He's a policy guy. <laughs> uh, policy guys are, are good thinkers when it comes to this kind of thing. Uh, but I was saying Dan Beardsley was, uh, I disrupted my own, my own thought, he was, was terrific at, at, at the diplomacy, and I can see that you're very skilled at it as well. The truth of the matter is, if anyone's going to be objective about this, is that Nick Mattiello pulled this car tax out of his wazoo in the middle of a District 15 very tight race uh, with not a lot of planning, as evidenced by the time it took to kind of get out the numbers on this whole thing. The governor kind of doubled down on the idea, kind of like, hey, me too on the car tax with a 30% reduction in value proposal in her state of the state, and uh, Nick Mattiello has more or less moved that aside because this is his baby. Um, we are all, not just the League of Cities and Towns, burdened with having to deal with a campaign pressured policy change that really is not zero based on good policy. Well, one thing that is important, and the reason I think a lot of our municipal leaders are in favor of car tax reform in general, is that it is, um, as you saw Tony Pires in the clip, um, it is property tax relief. And we have, Rhode Island has one of the highest property tax burdens in the country, or either fifth or seventh, depending on how you, you look at that. And car tax is probably one of the most frustrating components of that property tax burden. So. You know, if, if we were if we're up to the cities and towns, we might be doing a broader look at property tax and uh, and taking a look at, at various forms of property tax relief. But the fact that we're focusing on car tax it still has some some value. Well, Tony Pyre has made a good point. Uh, he's a he's a pretty sharp egg. He's a former you know finance chairman of the house, and you know is the administrator for uh, Mayor Grebbe in, in Pawtucket. And more or less, he said what everybody's going to say who runs a city or a town. 
hey, if you're getting all the money to us, you know, have a party. Yeah. So it, it's it, really, it, it's as simple as that. So if everybody's going to be made whole mm -hmm. to the dollar that they're expecting, see, I don't think most Rhode Islanders understand the mechanics of the car tax. Right, right. Right? Yeah. That the car tax is, 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 and I've given you this lesson a bunch of times and on the radio as well, weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRO, but the car tax is something that's locally generated with permission by the state, by the communities. The money stays in the community. The thresholds, remember when Governor Allman had the wipeout plan, and we've got up to $6,500 in, in, in waiver. If your car was worth twenty grand and you had 6000 in waiver, you got taxed on 14000 based on the rate in your particular town. When Governor Cherry went, uh, at the end of his tenure to say, we got big problems here, we got a lot of fiscal uh, duress, and I have no more money to squeeze, so the town's better squeeze, because uh, we're going to eliminate that waiver, it went down to $500 option for the communities and most communities took out the waiver mm -hmm. because what happens is so you understand the state reimburses the towns on that waiver money mm -hmm. right. right i don't think most I, I bet you eight out of ten viewers don't even know how that works it's very complicated well my audience is a little smarter but good I don't know. but also compounding the fact is that the rates were frozen in 1998 so there has you know, communities that had low rates and low reliance on car tax have, have had those same rates for 20 plus years. So the system is all out of whack between the, the, cha the differences in exemptions, the differences in rates. The rates can vary below $20, $20 per thousand in, um, in Providence. It's, it's, yeah. $19.80. It's, 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 exactly. And 60 bucks in, in Providence. In Providence, it's 60. So it's, it's, a, it's the Wild West because it is a policy that has just been allowed to kind of come apart at the seams over the years, and we need a, a, a hard look at comprehensive reform. Okay, so here's the rub when we come back. Is it reform or a wipeout? Because if they're really gonna wipe it out in three, four, five years, he's not gonna worry about reform. We'll be right back. My budget cuts every single car tax bill in the state by at least 30%. Let's be responsible about it. Let's make sure the cut is sustainable and affordable. Yeah, all right, so the governor tried to get a, a kind of a middle ground between what Mattiello was doing, the speaker, with a five-year car tax repeal. Now it's gonna be six based on spreading it out a little bit. Um, I thought the speaker kind of gunked it up a little bit with this, you know, multifaceted formula, all of which I'm not gonna get into right now. Uh, you like the formula? Well, one thing the formula does is it, it takes different approaches. When the last time we tried to do repeal, it was purely the exemption base, that waiver amount that you talked about. It started off at 500 and moved its way up to 6,000. But what it didn't do was change the rates. So when that system was changed later, you went, as I mentioned, it's sort of the Wild West. Every community is different. What's a little more beneficial about this approach uh, is that you start to harmonize the rates. You're bringing the, the rates down slowly uh, uh, by creating a rate cap. You're also taking the assessed value of the car from 100% of clean retail value and you're bringing that down slowly. Everybody hates the fact that the bill, the assessed value of the car that they get the bill on is they could never get that, uh, they could never sell their car for that. Well, so that's frustrating yeah, for them. I, I, <laughs> I agree completely. I, look, the, the, the rate suppression in places like Providence makes those communities happier. But the truth of the matter is, is that this is a big reach because the money out of the state budget is substantial. It's nearly a quarter million dollars by the time this whole thing is done on an annualized basis. Right. We're gonna go from 20 and change to a quarter million dollars and change in six years out of the state budget, meaning money that is gonna have to be replaced as local aid to cities and towns. Right. You know, when I first came here to New England from New Jersey where we didn't have a car tax, high property taxes, right. but not a car tax, I thought to myself, you know, this is the dumbest thing in the world. I first moved to Massachusetts, and at least it was $25 per thousand across the state. Mm -hmm. There was no vehicle value commission. There was no clean retail value period. It's what you purchased the car for with a formula that reduces to 90, 60, 40, 20, 10%, mm -hmm. and that's it. As simple as that. It makes the thing so much easier. But that reform came with Proposition 2.5 mm -hmm. back in the day, 25 years now ago. And that was a property tax, 2.5% levies, overrides. It was a package. I still think, no matter what they do with this reform for cars, 
you guys are still jammed up with inequities in property tax rates. We don't have a system for that uh, other than the archaic one that we're working with. Uh, I would think that you'd be the perfect organization to start talking about total reform, maybe not elimination of the car tax, but a, again, what were your principles? It was uh, make the towns whole and harmonize and make sure that everybody is taxed on, a, on, a, on an even basis. Re just repeating Massachusetts formula for taxation on property would do all of that. Right. And so that's as you I mentioned. Me? As I mentioned earlier, yeah. I think if we if it were up to the the cities and towns, that we'd have a l much larger conversation about property taxes because some some communities have a very low reliance on property ta on uh, on motor vehicle taxes. You have places like Newport where it's three percent of their property taxes come from motor vehicle, but in prop in in uh, Pawtucket it's fifteen percent. So even the reliance on motor vehicle is different. So we have a. It'd be nice to have a broad conversation but as I mentioned we, we pretty much handed this we knew that this was going to be a, a, a car tax conversation so that's what we focused on um, but again as the one thing that is nice is as the years go by under the speaker's proposal you do start to have more harmonization so you don't have those broad disparities it's not quite one state one rate like Massachusetts has but you're you're getting rid of some of the uh, the differences among communities, and you make us more competitive with Massachusetts and Connecticut. But still, that is all interimness, right? Under the concept that it's going to go away in six years, right? So, so I think it's a you know interim harmonization. I think is busy work when you're allegedly, allegedly en route to eliminating the tax. Now, if you're going to keep a sustained tax, then the rate equity and all that kind of stuff calls into play a la what I'm saying about Massachusetts. So what's your guess? What, do you, you, you think six years from now, God willing, that you and I are still sitting here and, and, and do you think we're going to be looking at, at, at a gone car tax? I don't. I think nobody knows. I think when, when Tony Pires and, and others in the General Assembly in 1998 were talking about repeal, they weren't expecting the Great Recession to upend their efforts. So that's why, again, I think the importance is if even you know the interim period, making sure the system is more fair and more equitable and more consistent, because we, we hope that we'll be able to do full repeal, but in the interim, we could at least make the system um, more logical and make more sense for people. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think you've thought through this pretty clearly <laughs> um, and, and, and not gotten in any trouble in the conversation, which is an art in of itself. <laughs> Listen, I'm bullish on some of the things the speaker has done. I really am. But I think this is a, this was one pulled from uh, the closet uh, to try to get reelected. And even though they junked it up with a lot of, you know, complicated thinking, it's, uh, it's still a short-term measure, seems to me, more politically driven than policy driven. But we'll see. Uh, Boy, the league has so many issues. Uh, come back often, okay? Whenever you Great. guys got some Happy stuff. Happy to. Yeah. All right. Uh, good luck in your position. Great. Thank nice you. to have you. Final word, and we come back. Stay with us. Check your tabs. Check your tabs. Look at this headline. Oh, Representative Perez, the state uh, representative out of Providence, was trying to I don't know sell some concept. They passed out some pamphlets, paperwork. Some of the tabs on uh, on the paperwork were porn. Come on, man. You know, I know a friend gave it to you. I get all that, but can we uh, can we tighten up a little bit? Proofread the stuff that we're handing out. I mean, how do you, how many do you hand out before someone says Debbie does Dallas? See ya.